By the way, welcome to Sifu's home. Okay, uh, we've been living here in the last 30, but this will be 36 years. Wow. 36 years. Okay. And after February the 4th, when the technical Chinese, technical New Year turning point comes, I'll be amazingly lunar age 78. Wow. Okay, because, and it's my wife's birthday today, but I make a mistake. I didn't tell her until last minute. She already made appointments with a friend for breakfast and for lunch. Mm -hmm. So she so can join us. Keep your promises in point. Sometimes don't give too many surprise announcements. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't always work. Okay. So, and last night, a couple of friends took us to dinner. The, the amazing thing was the table number, guess what? B13, birthday 13th. Oh, wow. And her birthday today is 13th. B, birthday. I said, how coincident. <laughs> wow, so it all worked out well. Now, it was a big, very important day, but a couple of things I want to announce. Uh, I've been teaching Tai Chi since 1975 and teaching Qigong since 19, I would say officially after the mid 1980s, 85 or something. But, okay, and not formally. Formally after 1994. So this year is important because it's exactly 30th anniversary. Is it 30 years? Yeah. Just <laughs> like yesterday. Okay. Now, just a little bit of history, how the Qi, Qigong group, the Shaolin Qigong group uh, started. So it was in the 1980s, okay, I was, I went to my dentist at uh, uh, 401 and uh, Bayview Avenue, southwest corner, Five Share. And then the secretary was a good friend of mine who's Hungarian. She always admired my car, always said this is a one down car anyways. Uh, thank you for the admiration. <laughs> and she said there's a, a good friend of hers called Debbie Summerfield and had some uncurable disease. So couldn't figure out what that was. It was dragging, dragging on for years. So I sent her to see me. So then I taught her Qigong and did acupuncture for her and over time she will recover completely. And then her husband was the staff sergeant of Canadian Air Force. Okay, uh, so it, or, and then after a while, the, uh, because the army had to relocate from time to time, they got sent out to Victoria, BC. She so says, "Now we won't be. We don't know when we can meet again the next time because in the army you have no control." So suddenly a light bulb clicked in my head. So why don't I make you my disciple? Okay. So as a disciple, you have a lifetime connection and a linkage. So Debbie became my first disciple around the time, around 1990. So time flies again. So, so many years passed by. All right. And then her picture is the top left, the leftmost picture on the wall. Yeah, she's Scottish. Her husband, is, so many things happen. And then, four years, nothing much happened. And then something happened in 1994. Okay, so a lady got possessed. So, we are good friends for a long time. So, every night, about between 2 and 4 a.m., her husband would call me, come save my wife. Because of my wife kept calling your name, and she kept saying, Sifu save me, Sifu save me. So that is three or four in the morning. I drove all the way to Scarborough, McCowan, and Sphinx, and uh, Steels. And then, first three nights, every time I went there, she come down. And then next night, I came back again. And one night, when I did a deep meditation, I came up with a poem, and that's a poem I wrote. And I 
took, took the poem with me, went to their home and stuck it on the wall. From that point on, she never possess again. So it's normal. So because of all this craziness happening, so we did, so she has a very good group of friends who also came to see me for treatments of, to learn something. So I set up my fir first official group of disciples. Disciple two, three, four, five, and six. One shot, five disciples. Okay. So that begins the whole thing. That's 1994. Now, majority of my disciples are scattered all over the world. They're multinational. Anywhere from any, you name any colors you think of, chances I have that. <laughs> I believe in the world Colors don't matter. It's who you are. Under the skin, we are all the same. Sometimes I wonder if we are human or we are robots. <laughs> okay, so that's what it is. Now, as time went on, there's a lot of ups and downs. People quit, not quitting, but going to other countries, doing other things. So they are not, majority of them are not in Canada. I got disciples in Germany, disciples in France, disciples in England, and disciples in now Mexico, <laughs> and uh, five disciples in Miami. Okay, and some of my disciples were well famous, like uh, Jimmy Cliff, disciple 41, had the Order of Jamaica. He's the most renowned singer of Jamaica, and he had a band of 14 musicians in Paris, France. Another world famous one is obviously Elvis Toiko, who's a six time champion of figure skating in Canada. Okay, twice gold medal in the world championship, twice silver medal in the Olympics. Okay. So some of these people, they, they came to see me for different reasons. Okay, some personal reasons, some health issues, some are just lost in the journey of life in one direction. And we became not just seafood students, we became good friends. Okay, because in my um, uh, mind, we are all equal. Okay, so a good teacher is also a good friend. A good student can also be a good friend. They work hand in hand. Okay, I don't have um, arrogance or anything, power, anything. I think that we can get together means something. Okay. And there's a reason for that. Out of millions, zillions of people, why us? Okay. So, but in my years of practice, I'm always a lone wolf, and I'm so glad to have you all. And Yen suggested to set something up more officially, so people have more focal point. So he set up something called the Center of Inner Health, which I agree with great. Uh, and I want to say clearly, this is the baby of Yen. Okay, he's the founder of this association, Center of Inner Health, not me. What's my role in the center? My role is strictly one thing, at all. <coughs> because I found out the moment I get in co partnership, cooperation with other things, it never worked out. For example, at one point when I was in the IT consulting field in 1988-89 period, <coughs> I set up a company called 5G Consulting Inc. with a good friend who's a math PhD from University of Waterloo. That thing only lasted one year and didn't go anywhere. Never worked out. And then uh, I also invited to be uh, with some other thing called H-E-L-O, Qigong Association. As an, but it never worked out either. Okay, I helped them a lot to get started, but then they want me to get in. The moment I put my name as one of the directors, the thing died. So I found them, and I looked at my own life, I always charted my own life. I cannot be in any partnership or a board member of anything. I'm who I am. So the center of inner health is the baby of Yen. Anything, whatever financially or strategy-wise is strictly the brainchild of Yen. 
and my role is advisor. And I'm the founder and head of the Shaolin Qigong group, okay, which is in a way associated but in an advisory manner. So I want to make it very clear. Understand? Okay. And so that's why I announced it. Now, why have a plant disciples? Because in 1974, in case you don't know the history, <laughs> that year, unfortunately <coughs> or fortunately, for one reason or another, I got bone cancer. So as a result, my fibula and my right leg was removed. But I refused chemotherapy or radiation. I, I could be stubborn, but in a mild manner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, and I believe that one day I will learn something that can convert my life. And if I don't learn it, it's heaven's will. If I learn it, thank you, and I'll share that with the world for free. And that was 1994. In 1974, 1975, a good friend of mine, who later on became a, a medical doctor, very good friend, and we knew each other from 1971. And that's Dr. Richard Chang, C-H-E-N-G. What happened was we had the inter-university um, competition in McGill University. And both of us were in the bleach team. They said parties, I completely forgot how to play bleach these days. And we had a lot of fun, we had common goals, we had common interests, mm. so we played the game. And it's not official, so we met the champion, so we charged the champion. Let's have a game. We won! <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I said, <laughs> tap the hand. So we came back to Toronto, we were in close contact, okay? And then in 1975, that was about um, July time, about summer to July, he took me to some place called Toronto Tai Chi Society Association, trying to meet with the founder, Master Moy. He wasn't there. So I looked at them. At that point, over 10 years, I learned the root of Tai Chi. Okay, so he wasn't there, and I looked at them. I didn't understand what they were doing. Obviously, nobody explained it. The club seemed to be very disorganized. Okay, so we just left. Two months later, that's early September, uh, Richard called me again. Master Moy is in today. Come, let's go. So I went to the club, and we met Master Moy first time ever. He, before he was teaching Tai Chi, was a Taoist monk from Hong Kong. And he was also a tailor, full-time job tailor, part-time job a monk. <laughs> Everybody carried two heads, Taoist, Taoist monk. <coughs> but his uh, stepbrother was a real Taoist monk, not no, no fake. So we met, we chat, and they asked me what did I learn before. I said I learned was Tai Chi. He said, you want, would you mind to show me? So I did a few things. He was silent. I said, Master Moy, he said anything, you can correct me. Mm, he said, do you want me to tell you the truth? I said, of course, <laughs> nothing is better than truth. He said, you are like a rusty ship. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a lot of uh, effort to correct the rust. You know what my answer was? I said, don't remove the rust, destroy the ship, build me a new ship. And I relearned the, the Yang Ta Tai Chi from beginning. Okay? And he, ne he said he never seen a crazy man like me. Every day after I finished work, I went to a club about 6 o'clock, I stayed there for 6 hours, Monday to Sunday, 7 days a week. And one exercise alone, I spent at least half an hour on it. So three years time, uh, three weeks time, I should say, I was walking normally. Instead of climping along, was long and building a lot of strength. And then by November, so two months after I joined the club, I said, Master Moy, you mentioned you had some wishes. 
Would you mind tell me what your wishes are? He said, wish number one, he want Tai Chi to spread across the country. Number two, he want the Tai Chi Club to move from a non-profit organization to a charitable <coughs> organization. Dream number three, a permanent site for the club. <coughs> it took me 12 months to make all three wishes come true. First, I said, this is November 1975. I had to reorganize the whole club. So I said, because my background in MBA, that makes it easy. Organization was my strength. Okay, I all, in my line of work, only worked as a laborer for four years. For the eight, 18 years, I always have been in management. Management for Ernst and Young, management for CP Limited, management for uh, CIB Civil County. Okay. So I knew how to manage them. So I set the club up in 1975. I defined Norman, who's a German guy, to be the president of the club. I said for the club to grow, the center person cannot be Chinese. It had to be white. And I said it loud and clearly. Because if it's not Norman, the club cannot grow. I said, Doug, okay, Doug Holtz, to be the uh, chief controller, somebody dedicated to look after money. Because a lot of people come to practice, they never pay a penny. So the rule is they come to club once, they pay the whole month's fee, $30. That's a lot of money at the time, <laughs> $30. I still remember when I was a student at University of Ottawa, my weekly meal, $3.50. Every night I had one potato, one carrot, that's it. Once a week I had one slice, thin piece of pot chop. Once a week. And I survived the first year of university. On that meal. We didn't have money. Perfect. Okay. So, with that, and also set up uh, Lloyd and another guy, John, to be the chief instructor. And both of them were hippies. I loved it long pony, ponytail, mustache, it would be it all over. Nice car, people with nice heart. So that organization was set up, money began to roll in. The red color words are gone, becoming black or blue, that means positive income. And then I said for the cup to grow, okay, first of all, you had to convince the government. So I brought Tai Chi to the Ontario government, first to the city of Toronto. Okay, and my name got known for one major reason. Because sometime in the late, in this winter of 1975, the police went to raid an underground casino where the old Chinese folks were doing mahjong. But no money on the table, mahjong. And so they destroyed it. And then these people didn't know who to turn to. The lawyer said they couldn't do anything. They came to a club and I was at the front desk as always. And they come approach me. So I wrote a letter to the mayor of Toronto. I wrote a letter to the chief of police, Mr. Armstrong. The mayor was crumpy. I wonder if it's related to the Mississauga mayor. Okay, David Crumpy. So he said, Ma Zhong, has been a Chinese pastime that bleach, okay, for thousands of years. Your police went there, raided them, and burned the Canadian money. And this is criminal. You cannot take a Canadian bill and burn it. Because it's a criminal offense. You know what? After that, came out in the big newspaper. As long as no money change hands, Ma Zhong is <coughs> perfectly legal to play in the gentleman or ladies club. That's why people in the clubs now they can play Ma Zhong freely. I was the one behind the scene. Part of this history disappeared. But I didn't want to boast it. I just helping the folks. I hate them to, to see them being bullied by the police. Okay. Another occasion was there's somebody called the Ghost Shadow Gang from New York. One guy came to the club and seek help. 
I said, he's being chased by the other gang members. I said, first of all, destroy your gun. He showed me his gun. I said, I don't want to see a gun here. Number two, I helped him to negotiate with other gang called the Green Bamboo Gang. Okay, because as the VP of the Tai Chi Club, because of my exposure to the community, what I said carry weight. And so they let him go. I said, from this point on, don't be in the gang anymore. Find a job, do something, even be a waiter. Be, be a good person. So he changed it. So he became a better person. So a lot of these little things happened during that period in the mid-1970s. So, so many years passed by. So I convinced the government because of my so many things they know me. So I took it to one of the major places I took Tai Chi to was Wuhan, Royal Ontario Museum. The second one, University of Toronto. Okay? And then University of Waterloo. Because that was where I came from. Okay? And then gradually I brought it to University of Ottawa, McGill University, Carlton University. Okay? So and then eventually I set up a rule, any be, anyone who learned Tai Chi for one week would be qualified to be a junior instructor for the beginners. Okay, and then I divide Tai Chi in three levels, beginning level, medium level, advanced level. So people know what to aim at. People say, why don't we do something like karate and belts? I said, I can't afford these belts. <laughs> Besides, I don't want it to become a fighting thing. So I warn people, there's no limit to what we learn, I said. So, so this is just teaching procedures, that's all. So some people began to go out of town, but they were so much into the idea. So people went to Calgary, set up Calgary Touches Association. So in 1976, I decided to rename the club. I said, as association is too local. I would say we have an umbrella club, so we call Taoist Tai Chi Society. And under the umbrella, if it's Toronto, it's Toronto Tai Chi Association, uh, uh, Montreal Tai Chi Association, Calgary Tai Chi Association, Vancouver Tai Chi Association, and the Halifax Tai Chi Association. So in less than one year time, I spread Tai Chi across the whole country. Besides that, people in the United States began to hear about me people coming from Buffalo and New York City. So I said, when you go back to Buffalo, set up Buffalo Tai Chi Association, set up New York <coughs> Tai Chi Association. So it began to, and Chicago, began to spread in the United States. So before end of 1976, Tai Chi was all over, under the umbrella Tai Chi um, Society. However, the key thing that happened was in 1976, I was leading a demonstration at Lawrence University. And the message came, my father was dying in Hong Kong. I had a choice, either I took the emergency flight back to Hong Kong to see him, or I stayed behind to finish my demonstration that would lead Tai Chi to Sudbury. Two choices, one is for one person, my father. One is for the group, for the future of Tai Chi. I chose the latter. So I decided to stay behind, finish demonstration, took Tai Chi to Lawrence University, and immediately next day came back to Toronto and got the emergency ticket, flew back to Hong Kong. Guess what? By 6 a.m. the next morning, I shocked when I woke up. And when I went back to Hong Kong, I timed it. That was exactly the moment my father died. So I missed him by one day. I guess it's have a real that we were not connected. Okay? But because of that, <coughs> something happened. Master Moore's teacher, Sifu Yang, Y A N G. So my mother definitely was an excellent marketer. Okay, she convinced Master Yang, even though the dad is gone, you try your best to save uh, my husband. But because of the mistake in the hospital, he is to pass away. Within 10 days, they operated on my father twice. The second operation killed him. 
uh, an operation on the spine. That's why I keep telling people, if a spinal problem, try not to touch it, not to operate on it. So he passed away. Since you can, cannot, you didn't save the dead, why do you save the life? So Master Yen tapped my head. Two o'clock next day, go to meet me at the park. Even up to that point, nobody knew his phone number, nobody knew where he lived. All we knew from, uh, from uh, some other news, he was a monk from the Northern Shaolin Temple because of China liberated. In 1949, he came to Hong Kong and because he was Ill illiterate. So he worked in the ice company. So to carry the ice block, you know how big the ice block is? Like Yen said, a thousand pounds or something. <laughs> okay. And every day he practiced his Qigong in the central park of Hong Kong, in the central district of Hong Kong. And people who thought he was crazy. Because of this short guy, bald head, three hairs in, on the head, who would do something weird, who would flip upside down, land on the ground on the top of the head, put the hand behind the back, and they can bounce on the ground on the head. They thought it's crazy. Okay, but it's nobody crazy. He's, he never talked to other people. Very selective. Okay, so then the first day when he pinched a few points on me, I got a chi and I began to move like mad. On the, it's a big <coughs> toilet park in, on Hong Kong Island. So I was flipping, somersault on the glass non-stop for three hours. And a lot of milkers came out. It's, then I barely heard him talking to my mother. Your son was so intoxicated, he's completely burned out inside. I heard it later on, I analyzed it, of course I got burned out. Because I, I worked beyond my limit. From primary school grade six, Right through university year one, I went through all these difficult years studying without hearing because I was deaf. I was deaf for 10 years because both the eardrums were gone. Okay? I was deaf because um, I was afraid of height. To conquer high fear, I jumped, I climbed up to the highest level of the swimming pool and jumped down. To conquer fear, you must face fear. And then my years over time got infected. Lots of mucus stuff came and pus came up from the ears. And lack of attention didn't know how to care. And that's why it caused me so much difficult come, difficulty coming to Canada. Interview at the immigration office turned me down. Never told me why. And and then I took out job teaching Bible and math <laughs> at a Catholic high school. <coughs> After class every day, I went to the immigration office, sat there, and then the officer finally noticed it. And one old man told me, and one night, and that life became my teaching for life. He said, young man, don't give up. Young man, don't give up five words. Okay. So I sat there <coughs> until the officer saw me and said, come with me, okay? So he said, you know why we can't give you a student visa? Because you did not pass a health test. I said, how? He said, you, you don't have hearing. When I'm talking to you now, I almost had a talk right here, beside my ear. Now I said, what can I do to qualify? He said, if University of Ottawa recognize this and still give you the admission, then it's okay. Canada went through the worst postal strike in history. That is July and August in 1970, uh, 1968. If you look at, look at Google, you'll find it. Yeah, Crystal is good at it. <laughs> okay? And then finally, I sent 10 telegraphs to University of Ottawa. They never replied once. That's the first time I learned about the administrative efficiency of French administrators. They couldn't care less or Canadian administrators. Then the strike got over, they sent me a letter. Immediately I took the letter to immigration and got the student visa. Even a simple thing, why would I teach for one year? Because I was admitted to University of Hong Kong, I was admitted to Chinese University of Hong Kong, okay, and I chose to come here. 
because I never believed I belonged to Hong Kong. But you know, I came here one day. I got used to Canada. I found Canadians to be super friendly. Okay, they treat me very well, and this by call the student friends took pick me up from the airport, <coughs> found me a place to live in. Amazing! I almost cried because it's so much. They barely knew me, and we built friendship. That's 1968. So, anyways, that's the past. That's how it all happened. And because that's so much hard work, and I and then I found my first job in the construction field because I couldn't go to restaurants. Any Canadian experience, <laughs> even as a waiter, <laughs> and that's why when I became manager, I was purposely hire people without Canadian experience, <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> I said I hired the person for the talent, not whether it's American, or Canadian, Chinese, or European. Doesn't matter. It's the person. <laughs> Why a Canadian experience? Doesn't make sense. But that's the first thing. In the, so I make 80 cents an hour. The average at the time is slightly over an, a dollar, I think. But I was happy. And this camera ends me. Okay, so that's the old days. Because all this hard work, and then every Friday night, by November 1960, I job in Longueuil, Montreal, as an assistant cook. So later I became an expert in making hamburgers. One handful, exactly one hamburger. <coughs> Practice makes perfect. And I was good in making fried rice. I never realized that's the way to do it. You cook a big pot of rice, you wash it, you hang dry overnight before you fry it. Otherwise, it, they all got stuck together. Lots of knowledge to learn. And so I worked, I finished my last subject in University of Ottawa Chemistry lab and usually halfway I got to sleep out to catch the long distance bus of <laughs> Montreal and then work until four o'clock in the morning and wake up the next morning eight AM and to prepare for the breakfast rush and work until the next the Sunday afternoon came back to Ottawa. And from November right through April and by April found a job in Prince Rupert, British Columbia. And so I, I always work long hours, crazily. So Master Yang said, there's a reason why this machine does me got so ruined, because all the years and years of beating up, beating up, beating up, no time for rest. But anyways, do I regret? No. I think everything happened for a reason. And because of my promised to myself in 1974. I said, if I learn something, I'll share that with the world. And if one day I become sick for myself, I will limit my disciples to one and to eight, which is a combination of 36 and 72, heavenly and earthly combinations. Okay, that's a, I, I take the opportunity to give you the story. I think it means something, okay? and. Thinking back, sometimes I I wet eyes too. Thinking back, all this happening, but looking at it, everything happened for a reason. If you have hard times, you learn from it. You smart yourself up and become more organized. That's the key. And over the years, I learned a very key word or two words: trust in time. Trust is one thing that I never break my promise once. If I promise you something, even 30 years later, I will fulfill my promise, no matter what. Even though it could be to my disadvantage, it does not matter. So the story is, before you make a promise, think about it many times. After you make a promise, whether it's right or not, fulfill it. Life or death, fulfill it. There's no more right or wrong, because you've got to live up to your promise. If I promise to deliver something by this day, you can go to bed with ease because it will happen. No matter what, even if I don't sleep, I will make it happen. Okay, so success doesn't come with ease, it's a lot of hard work. I want this lifetime story to be heard so we, people, I can share with you and make everyone here a better person. Now, then <coughs> we are all getting old. 
Okay, we need somebody to carry on that ship. Okay, we cannot kick on forever. Yan happened to be somebody, and actually I knew his wife before him. <laughs> okay. So we, we, and then I believe this uh, Andrew introduced you to me, right? Yeah, more than eight years ago. Time flies, just like yesterday. And then I found out this young man is about by the age of my, he's only one year older than my oldest kid, uh, 70, 80, 77. And my younger kid is 80. They are all in the age group. So seeing him is like seeing my son, but in a different manner. He's far more mature than my kids, obviously. My kids are still playful. <laughs> okay. So he's, one thing he strikes me is very spiritual. And I watch him, I said, he has yin and yang eyes. That means Yen is, was born with the capability to see beyond the four dimensions. Okay? So it's some, not something, but I said, I kind of felt if he would learn Qigong, combine that capability with Qigong, then he can gain extra power and can probably have far, far more people. And then he began to come to my Tai Chi class at first, can he, first marketplace, right? And Jimmy always got upset because he never followed what I did properly. <laughs> <laughs> Not just you. What can I say? <laughs> but I, I said, as long as he's got the idea, that's fine. Yeah, because you learn something, eventually we pick out the box. But before you can pick out the box, you have to be in the box. You cannot be good unless you know the fundamentals. Okay, all the Shaolin masters, the Tai Chi masters, never deviate from what the teacher taught them. It's right to the T, very precise. In fact, in the old fashioned school, when the children is not following properly, they use uh, Tang Tiao. <laughs> what's what Tang Tiao called in English? A uh, whip. Some, some sort of a whip. Like, <laughs> some kind of whip. Uh, uh, fine stick. <laughs> we not really hit, just to warn you. Yeah. This is a way to do I never do that anyways. But this is kind of the thing. They can call 911 when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, it's very strict until everything is so precise. Even when they go to public uh, uh, combat and also uh, competition. They have annual competition in central China, okay, the Chinese village, and very strict. If you don't stand at the right position, they did the marks. So the when Yan came to the first marketplace and did, we did our Tai Chi, he did his own Tai Chi. I said, lucky you are not in, in the Chinese village, <laughs> you'll be whipped. I don't know how many times you would have a very <laughs> red <really wet> bumper. <laughs> Okay, but once you master it, then you can be more di diverse. Okay, now, so why come up with the idea? Because, well, I think it's about time I can help Yen to establish, to have his own future to school. He's a good man with a good heart to help people. So I okayed him to set up the center of inner health, but to declare clearly, I'm an advisor. As I said right from the beginning, the moment I get into any association partnership, things fall apart. So I better stay clean now. We just advise it as an advisor, as a Sifu. So you can say this is a derivative of the Shaolin Qigong organization, which makes more sense. Anybody agree? Mm -hmm. You agree with that yet? Yeah. Okay. So any contributions? I am very grateful that Yen promised to organize this uh, once a year gala and with the help of Joe and Kevin. But I think this should be a little bit more formal committee. So some people looking after con marketing and se selling, some people looking after finances, some people looking after the on-site management with the a promise of Jimmy could look after the fun table, right? The tickets. Don't know yet. Nobody asked me, okay, so I'm not saying anything. 
Okay. Nobody well, told me yeah, that. you say the word. You can ask him. It's very important to have a team because one person cannot handle everything. If one person trying to do every job, that's not a leader. A leader's job is good in delegation, organization. The helper's key is about kind of um, reporting back, so communication is key. A lot of things fail because of lack of communication, a lot of guesswork. I'm guessing this, I'm guessing that, assuming. Organization is very important. A strong team is very important. Now, in China, for example, why did Mao Zedong win over China? Why did Chiang Kai-shek lost when he had, oh, 100 times more soldiers than, than the communists? Not just from the help of the people, uh, one more very important reason, teamwork. Chiang Kai-shek's team was for him, that's it. Okay, he, does, he never listened to anyone else. Whereas Mao Zedong had a very ironclad team. He had Chao and Lai to look after the public relations, coordinations. He had uh, the other one, okay, to look after the army, and he had a very good team of generals and worked very iron tight team. Okay, so General Zhu looked after the army. Zhang Lai looked after foreign affairs. Mao Zedong is the head of the whole thing. But you ask Mao Zedong to carry a gun to march the phone, he can do that. So a leader doesn't need to do it. A leader is organized. <coughs> He's a strategic planner. So that's what I want to say. So uh, any contributions, everything financial, should have, I guess Joanne is taking on that role, organize it well. And so things go to the Center in Health. Don't give me a single penny because I'm the advisor. This is fun for the world, fun for the group. Okay, so I spent, wow, more than quarter, two, three quarters an hour talking about this. Any objections, opinions? <coughs> if not, let's go to the most important part today. Okay. Why did I put pick 108? Because it's a number of competition. Why Roger, who's Punjabi? There's a hidden message there. The founder of Shaolin Temple was Indian, Mang Tamo. So I think my last disciple should also be Indian. I never told anyone when, I ha when it, it just happened. And they asked, Roger asked me three to six times to become a disciple. Every time I said a thing about it. <laughs> Finally done. So, but there are more people like to join this sweet family. So to make it happen, the banner had to carry on. Somebody had to carry the Olympic banner, the, the torch. So I say, uh, Ian would be a good candidate to be the next generation Sifu. I asked uh, Horace, disciple 105. I asked Jimmy 104. They didn't want to be Sifu. They, are, they have other occupancy, other interests, which is OK. This is a democratic country. And I think Ian fits the bill very well. His background in management consulting, his knowledge and his openness, his kind heartedness, I think all this will fit the bill. And I think he will carry on good energy, pass good energy to the next generation. So officially in Northern Shaolin, my Northern Shaolin generation is almost 30. But in the late, mid to late 80s, okay, then I rejoined Southern Shaolin and I became officially certified George 20 generation of the Southern Shaolin Temple. Okay, and one of our key exercises is the one finger discipline. Okay. So, we be, so the next generation 21 is Yen, Jimmy, Hans, and so be, after that will be generation 22. Don't feel that is a big number. You are going to have generation 23, and your 23 generation will have 24. I hope this good work, this beautiful thing, can carry on for indefinite time. That's why we're here today. 
Now, what got me out to do what I do today? Thanks to politics. Because in 1993, a force come to me. I, that's, my life is changing. I had to do something different. And the trip to Mexico. Donnie, Mexico changed my life. Yeah, mine too. Yeah, because when I went to Mexico City, I did feng shui for later for the governor of Hidalgo, Jesu Karam. And from that experience, I said, a broken country like Mexico with good politicians can turn around the economy of the country. Canada was in turmoil in 1993. So I decided to run politics. I decided to run member of parliament. Even if I, if I won, I definitely can do a lot of good to the country. If I failed, my, my experience can encourage a lot of people on my time to run politics and help the country. So that's the motivation. And I learned a lot. The first week, the first time you had to win the nomination. And I was the fifth one in the poll. Because there were four people, local people already registered. So I, I'm, I was called a parachuter because parachuting myself from Richmond Hill to Scarborough, Roos River. While well, facing four people who were all local, and I was a foreign one, and I was Chinese. Chinese in that time who rarely won politics. <laughs> they were in restaurants and laundries, <laughs> cleaning clothes and won restaurants. So you know how I won the nomination? I made 1,000 yellow caps. Every cap said vote polling. And everybody coming into the place, no matter what, who they vote for, everybody got a cap. So when you stand on stage, it's like a sea of yellow caps with blue words. Every blue word says vote polling. <laughs> Psychologically, I already beat the other four candidates. So it's called brainwashing, sir. Eh? It's called brainwashing. <laughs> <laughs> it's marketing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just like Coca-Cola. If you don't drink Coca-Cola, you don't have a good life. <laughs> Something like that. Okay. So, anyways. So in the second round, so first round was me and another guy. We later on became friends anyways. Politics is funny. On the stage you kill each other, downstage you shake hands. Okay. So uh, second round always said, well, I went over him, hands down, easy. And still I became the candidate and a week after that, we were sent to Ottawa for one week. Door locked training. Call you four o'clock in the morning. By the way, there's such a news, somebody just killed. What's your response? Things like the surprise news. It's eight o'clock in the morning, you were barely waking up. Suddenly, something knocked at your door, something happened. How do you respond? Telephone interview, TV interview, surprise people objecting, give you hell. I hate your party, your son of a bitch of a row. How do you respond? Wow. That one week training is worth a 20 year education. It's very really interesting, I learned a lot. And I also learned that in the political circle that's called inner circle, outer circle. I was the outer, outer circle. <laughs> <laughs> and in the inner circle was just a few, okay? And then <laughs> one thing I heard, unfortunately in the last strategy they did, Somebody came up with the idea to Kim Campbell, saying that Song Kletchen had a tilted mouth, he should not qualify, he should not qualify to be Prime Minister. The moment I heard it, I said, the PC party is going to fall apart. And you know who made the suggestion about the tilting mouth? John Tory. Mm -hmm. He was the advisor to Kim Campbell. That's why I knew him too well. So what a stupid comment. Because that actually turned around the vote completely. And the PC had only two members left. Worse than liberal today. You know, people hated it. They should not say, they should have praised some person to be hero. To fight off his bond with defect. To go climb to that position. Okay, so 
So that's, but that also taught me a lesson. At that time, I was director of ITCIBC, head of Wigan Computer Department. I found out my life no longer belonged to a corporation. I belonged to the people. When I shake hands with people, I found warmth. When I knock at the door, talk to the households, I found homeward. So I knew I no longer belonged to a corporation. So I went back to Wigandi. One week later, I resigned. Goodbye. You know what the irony was? One year after I resigned, the whole department got outsourced to ADP. No longer existed. They saved about $15 million budget every year, <laughs> including my salary. <laughs> OK, so I took a long, windy road to explain how we are here today. If you trace back with this one hour speech I said, I rarely said so long. There's a reason for everything that happened in our life. When we are at the bottom of our life, no income, nothing, that forces us to open our mind to think what is God or what is heaven trying to teach us. We learn from it, we become better people. With that, no more delays. Now, we are having four new disciples. For Fortunately, the first one is having a good time <laughs> in the sunny Mexico. So we are going to do one for her on Zoom, and when she returns to Toronto, we find a way to do it officially, mm. just for you, okay? Continue. Okay, so Don, congratulations on becoming disciple uh, number seven, 22nd generation Shaolin Qigong disciple. Uh, you are admitted uh, with a following promise, to abide by the dis disciplines in being righteous, honest, and respectful, and to consistently pursue the welfare of mankind. So, congratulations. Welcome to the Thank family. You. you should say, I will. I will. <laughs> I will. I will do my absolute best. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, don't, don't move. Uh, we did that. So, one, okay. Thank you. I'm having a tea. So I <laughs> and I'm pretending to be you. <laughs> see, Jorge is more flexible now. Jorge is you today. <laughs> Gracias, Jorge. Thank no, you. Right. I will have mine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mighty will go on this edge. <laughs> and we'll keep this for you uh, for when you back. Thank so you so much. Proof of evidence, right? Okay. Generation Shadow Disciple number eight to abide by the dis disciplines in being righteous, honest, respectful, and to consistently pursue the welfare of mankind. Let's do one thing first before we clap. Okay. Put it there. Okay, so. Let's do it properly. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Did you drink all of that in one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I drink beer. <laughs> So, Andy, you should say, I will. I will. <laughs> a beautiful lady. <laughs> okay. OK. 
Okay. Next is Mr. Kevin Boucher. 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 It's like that. Boucher. Boucher. Uh, admitted as 22nd generation Shadow Disciple number 9. And you abide by the principles of being righteous, respectful, and honest, and to continuously pursue the welfare of mankind. It's good practice uh, for you, right? Eh? Yeah, it's great. It's <laughs> really exceptional. Thank you. Well, if we can kneel down the floor, we are God blessed. How many people can even do that? <laughs> yeah. No, you're good. We'll fix that. <coughs> Thank oh. you. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Very quick, guys. <laughs> you may never walk again. <laughs> yeah, got it. Quick. And Ms. Caroline Hong is admitted as 22nd generation disciple number 10. And you do have agree to abide by the disciplines in being righteous, honest, and respectful, and to pursue the betterment of the welfare of mankind. I will. should be in the choir. <laughs> 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 right? All right. All right. Thank you.